We have as our moderator for this panel, Dr. Elizabeth Prodromu, Harvard University Center for European Studies, former vice chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Our panelists are Doug Bandow, senior fellow of the Cato Institute at Washington, D.C., Professor Cole Durham, Susie Young Gates, professor of law and director of the International Center for Law and Religious Studies at the J. Reuben Clark Law School at Brigham Young University. We have Yanis Kitisakis, Assistant Professor of Human Rights Law at Bogazizi University in Istanbul, Turkey, and Demokritas University in Thais, Greece. And he is also the legal advisor to the Ecumenical Patriarchate. And we have Professor Muna Nadulo, Professor of Law at Cornell Law School, Director of Cornell's Institute for African Development, human rights advocate, and humanitarian uh, in Ithaca, New York. So I will turn it over to Dr. Bradomu. Thank you. Thank you all for your patience um, and uh, a long day. We've uh, come to a plan that we hope will be acceptable to you. We're going to move quickly through each of the, uh, in the interventions of my esteemed panelists. I'll make one simple response. And then I think what we'll do is um, give you an opportunity to ask questions to the panelists. Um, and when we get there, I'll remind you, of course, that a question actually ends in a question mark, OK? So um, <laughs> with no further ado, so that we can abide by the time constraints, let's begin with Dr. Dorham. Well, it's a, a pleasure for me to, to be here. Uh, it's been humbling listening to uh, the panels during the day and uh, sensing uh, the, the magnitude of the problems and the challenges. I, I uh, am also struck by where we are. I remember, as I'm sure many of you do, seeing the telecast from this location in 1989 when the wall came down. Uh, I, at that point, spent about a quarter of my life, or, or you know, about a tenth of my life, I guess, in Germany. Uh, and so I had a lot of uh, association with the significance of that wall coming down. Uh, just a few weeks before that happened, I had become the secretary of the American Society of Comparative Law. And I was, uh, as a result of the events of the wall coming down, uh, catapulted really into all kinds of law reform initiatives going on in Central and Eastern Europe after that time. So this was very significant to me. What I want to direct your attention to, though, is the experience I had about six months later. Uh, I was on a trip through Central and Eastern Europe, and I happened to be here in Berlin on the day that they announced that they were going to bulldoze the rest of the wall. Uh, some of you have some idea of the magnitude of that task, given just how extensive and strong the wall was. And I remember gathering some of the rocks that, from some of the bulldozers and taking them home. I've got them in my uh, office at home. Uh, but th what I want to just emphasize is that it's not just bringing down walls. It's we need to think about what to do next. Or uh, someone talked this morning about the ground clearing and what, really what it takes to build a new world after the walls come down. Now, I have a number of images of walls coming down. Uh, one thing that can happen is you can tear down walls and leave a vacuum. I think that's uh, sort of what happened in Iraq. Uh, there are ways that walls become irrelevant. Think of uh, the significance of social networking, uh, for example, or I remember being at the Alhambra uh, earlier, uh, about a month ago, and ha having all the armaments described to me. And of course, they're all just sort of totally irrelevant, given modern uh, technology. Uh, so, so that's another way that you know, walls may disappear. Uh, I, I think I've often uh, been impressed by a passage uh, from uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 58. It talks about building in the old waste places, being a repairer of the breach, a restorer of paths to live in. 
And I, I think in the ultimate sense, what's vital is that we be able to uh, tear down the walls in, in human hearts. Uh, and this is really the ultimate challenge. I was struck a little earlier today, someone mentioned uh, magic wands, or I guess one could say there are no magic wands. I've worked in, on laws in a lot of places, and sometimes people think that once you write w words on paper, this will be a magic wand to change reality. Uh, but of course, that's not how it works. There can be prayers, there can be good fortune, but much depends on people willing to do the long and arduous work of building bridges uh, and resolving problems that of, of the kind that have just been described to us, in fact. Uh, often we restore paths to live in by building those kind of bridges. Now I think in the process of rebuilding, we do need to think about uh, international instruments. And the theme uh, of this session is looking at the insistence that, of the instru international instruments on uh, neutrality, on pluralism. And uh, I think sometimes, uh, as we go in tomorrow and talking about constitution building, sometimes we forget that the process of renewing constitutions or building new constitutions is not something that goes on with the tabula rasa. I remember working on the Iraqi constitution in 2005, and one of the things we realized is that Iraq had actually ratified, without reservation, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, this meant that there were some substantial obligations. Uh, countries retain their obligations even if there's a regime change. Sometimes there are regime changes that ignore international law, but this, uh, it's important to, to bear in mind that we have that, uh, that background. Uh, we're bound, of course, not only by the language of the international instruments, but they are powerful because they help shape the expectations that people have. They reflect those expectations and desires, and they help uh, uh, in the sense that others, as, as countries are held to account by the international community, uh, that is obviously important. Now, in many ways, the Turkish situation is arguably more complex. I, I remember many years ago, uh, well, not that many, but uh, uh, the, U, the, uh, the EU had issued some guidelines, among other things, that uh, Turkey needed to rapidly adopt a Western-style association law that would accommodate registering of churches, religious organizations. Uh, this uh, rapid request uh, has not been met, but I remember working on this issue and realizing just how difficult it was uh, because uh, there, there wasn't, a, a legal framework in place to do it. If you tried to do a, a legal framework, it was against what was really some of the genetic code provisions of the Turkish constitution. And you couldn't easily change those because they were unamendable. And I think one of the things I realized at the time is that much depends on being able to reinterpret what some of those background uh, provisions mean, what the reinterpreting the Lausanne Treaty. I mean, I remember naively reading the Lausanne Treaty and thinking, oh my goodness, this is great. They just say you should treat minorities equally. That will solve the problem. Uh, well, as we know, it doesn't get interpreted that broadly and that easily. But perhaps viewing it against the, the background of intervening international instruments and so forth, it gives sort of an opportunity for a new way of a new and broader and more flexible way of looking at things. And I think that is really uh, what is vital. All of the specific problems, unless one can solve the broader problem of a kind of uh, rigid and uh, unyielding notion of secularism, that needs to give way to a more uh, flexible, more uh, <coughs> open kind of secularism, the kind of uh, secularity that we have in many other countries. There are a lot of different models, but what the models, the good models have in common 
is they make it easy for religious communities to organize. They make it easy for religious communities to be able to have <coughs> legal entities. And they make it easy for religious communities uh, to be able to acquire uh, property, to be able to have places of worship. All of these things that make freedom of religion or belief uh, a meaningful reality. Well, let me just uh, just uh, wrap up by by saying uh, what what's really critical is that we need to find ways and uh, to find flexible ways to open up uh, the the basic constitutional notions that are the framework and that make it possible to uh, be to, to provide new paths for people to live in. Thank you. Well, it is a great pleasure to be here. It's, I'm honored given the quality of the panelists as well as the audience. It's a fantastic setting as people have noted. I think it's a wonderful ecumenical gathering. I speak as an evangelical Protestant from the United States. And the subject, of course, is extraordinarily important as set in the backdrop of essentially a multinational pogrom against Christians in the Middle East and the threatened disappearance of Christians from the <coughs> cradle of Christianity. Turkey could play a very positive <coughs> role, but it also could play a negative role. I think it matters extraordinarily what Turkey does on these issues. We've all heard a lot on the problems that non-Muslim <coughs> minorities face or non the religious minorities face in Turkey of social discrimination and government discrimination, the disabilities of the non-Muslim churches, the ecumenical patriarch and others, and certainly a general authoritarian climate that seems to be growing in that country. I mean, we have to acknowledge there has been some progress over the last decade, but there's a lot of negatives, and I think George, for example, this morning pointed to the fear of the future, what something like the coding may mean, how that could play out and be used in the future. I think that you know, Turkey in certain ways is caught in between the two poles of anti-religious liberty thought. If one looks around the world, the great persecutions tend to occur the secular extreme, which very much the communist and former communist states that want no other competitive, transcendent philosophy there that they claim the whole person. And within the religious realm, it's the totalitarian Muslim states, the Saudi Arabia, the Iran, which treat very badly, very violently, those who are not of the dominant Muslim faith. If you look at Turkey, it went through a long period of relatively ruthless secularism, certainly not at the communist stage, but nevertheless brutal itself. Turkey is now moving in the fear, I think it's moving towards the other pole. It's not there, but the concern is where does it end up? I think if anyone who believes in a humane society you know, has to hope that Turkey finds the right place within, in between that allows a Muslim identity but protects the, the rights, the liberties, the, uh, the humanity of the human person of everyone within that community, whatever their religious beliefs. What kind of a model should Turkey adopt? Of course, it's, as an American, it's very hard for me to preach to Turkey what to create within its own society. I think a country that is 99% Muslim will inevitably have, as a society, a Muslim identity. The question is what kind of identity and what role for political and legal forces. My hope is that those in authority would perhaps separate a view of kind of religion and society, religion and politics, from the much more narrow view of kind of church and state, mosque and state, recognizing that one should have a free play of values within a society, and I believe a society of 99% Muslims will inevitably have a Muslim character within that larger society, but protecting a free debate, free expression, free activity by everyone within that society is part of an open process, and at the same time being very, very protective when it comes to the institutions of the state and the coercive institutions of the state as applied to institutions of the church recognizing the threat that that poses to human conscience and basic freedoms and human rights. And that, of course, is where we see problems in Turkey today. As Turkey moves forward, my hope would be that uh, Turkish authorities would recognize if they hope to be a global leader, it is very important to protect these values, that they cannot purport to speak on behalf of humanity and their region if they do not protect those who are most vulnerable within their society and the basic right of conscience within that society. 
that if they want to join Europe, if they want a good relationship the, with the United States, Europe and the United States view these values very, as very important, that if they want an economically productive society, they want every member of that society to be a full participant, free and able to participate entirely within all institutions. That requires protecting freedom of a conscience and freedom of association. And also to be protective against the threat of abuse, abuse which the current prime minister faced and spent, uh, was convicted, in fact, many years ago, that he, of all people, should recognize the threat that is opposed by a state that imposes <coughs> its you know, <coughs> alien values potentially on those of religious faith. This is a critically important issue. It's a matter, I think, of a, what a decent society, a society that protects human rights, a society that wants to have a leadership role. There is a role, I think, to be played by Turkey's friends. You know, no one can impose values upon Turkey, but Europe, in terms of association with Turkey, America, in terms of a long-time friendship and alliance, should certainly talk about dialogue on these issues, indicate the importance of the protection of Christians and other religious minorities, how that matters to American and European society. That Turkey needs to understand these are critically important issues. So again, I, I, I want to be very brief because we are you know, limited on time. But if one looks across the Middle East today, I, it's extraordinary what Christians and others of relig min religious minorities are going through. We should be protective of our brethren. We owe our brothers and sisters in faith and in Christ our best efforts, and we, that effort should be extended towards Turkey, that the protection of these folks should be part of our obligation to brothers and sisters around the world. Thank you very much. Is the state neutrality an excuse for an indirect discrimination against religious minorities? Does a secular state like uh, France has the right to prohibit all believers to wear religious symbols or clothing in the public sphere? Does a formally secular state like Turkey has the right to refuse and demand for exemption from the general protective measures concerning the use of historical monuments? Your Eminence, Dr. Liberakis, ladies and gentlemen, in the next four minutes, I will try, I will argue that religious minorities enjoy, in certain circumstances, the right to demand exception from neutral provisions or, let's say, general measures. Well, in my view, there is a clear distinction between the first and the second example. In the case of headscarf in France, the question concerns rather the innermost conviction of the individual, the readiness and urge to realize faith, than the classical manifestation of conviction, like place of worship, education, etc. And in this context, in the context of the innermost conviction, there is no room for neutral limitations. I know that it sounds a little bit strange for Orthodox or Catholic Christians that clothing is a part of innermost conviction. But I shall stress that for other religious communities, like Sikhs, Buddhists, Orthodox Israelis, religious <coughs> faith is equivalent to symbolism, clothing, special, specified living condition, like nutrition, sacrificed nutrition, conduct with earth and water, and in general, to everyday behavior. In this view, more than European human rights law is ready to crystallize this modest and realistic at the same time approach of religious freedom. Three years before, in the case of Ahmed Aslan and others versus Turkey, the applicants, all members of a religious group known as Anjimenti Tarikati, complained of their convictions in 1997 for a breach of law on the wearing turban, baggy trousers, a tunic and a stick. The European Court of Human Rights found a violation of freedom of religion. Last week, the plenary of Strasbourg Court examined the complaint of a practicing Muslim women wearing headscarf in public places in France. I'm rather sure that the plenary's judgment will confirm the Ahmed Arslan case law. But there are cases where religious neutrality may take precedence over the right to manifest one's religion. And this is my second example, the use of historical monuments. 
at first it is acceptable for the needs of collective manifestation of religious beliefs to give a permission to a religious group to use an old place of worship in this specific manifestation. This specific manifestation is not opposed to public order. This was the case of Sumela Monastery in Trabzon. Once per year, a few believers in an area where no other place of worship exists for Orthodox Christians. But state authorities have the right and the duty under neutral and general provisions to protect any big or small historical monument which is located near several other places of worship. In other words, the Muslim majority cannot ask for an exception from the general prohibition to use a Sophia because, firstly, they can pray in several other mosques just near a Sophia. Secondly, because Muslim believers are not one or two thousand believers, people, but millions, and they are bound to cause damage to the building. And finally, because there is a historical tension between the Muslim majority and the Orthodox minority concerning the use of the monument, and this is a very significant public order reason for denying the use of the monument for the reasons for the needs of the worship. In conclusion, by adopting neutral constitutional provisions, the majority doesn't satisfy the requirements of freedom of religion of minorities. The modern European perception of religious freedom demands from European secular states to focus to set on exceptions from general neutral measures. <coughs> One is the example of the heterograph, but there is no doubt that this is not the case of the religious use of historical monuments by the religious majority in a certain state. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, moderator, for this opportunity to say a few words on this uh, issue. Uh, your eminences, uh, and, uh, the organizers of uh, the, the conference. I'd like to thank in particular uh, Dr. Ambarakis and uh, uh, Mr. George Rokas for inviting me and involving me in this process uh, where I've really learned quite a great deal uh, of uh, information and knowledge, which is extremely uh, valuable. Now, uh, I would like to focus more on um, what we need to do in order to uh, realize the goals that we want to achieve. I think that uh, at the level of uh, international uh, instruments, uh, the norms are very clear. I mean, both uh, you know, my colleagues and others earlier on today I've referred to the various international conventions, you know, the, the covenants, and uh, we also have regional instruments, you know, the American convention, the European convention, the African convention, they're all very, very clear in terms of uh, uh, the norms. But I think as we go forward, uh, we need to continue to emphasize the responsibility of states, uh, and that what is it that they undertake to do once they join these uh, uh, conventions. And I think this is very important that we continue to articulate this for two reasons. One, to clarify the norms, as, you know, and uh, area on those reference in terms of when you are, for example, developing a constitution, that it is very empowering. But also, it does empower our colleagues who work at national level in terms of support so that they actually uh, can pursue these uh, goals. And I think states, when they, under, when they join these conventions, do undertake to ensure that, in fact, uh, they guarantee these rights within their jurisdiction, and also that they promote uh, these rights within their jurisdiction. And thirdly, that in the event that these rights are being violated, they must provide remedies uh, to persons that are, uh, you know, whose rights are uh, violated. But um, I think that um, uh, that, of course, means that uh, basically a state uh, must create a framework within which these rights must, uh, could, you know, must, uh, can be enjoyed, uh, passing legislation you know, to ensure that uh, they give effect to these rights within the domestic uh, environment. Uh, but uh, it also involves uh, being sensitive towards uh, 
uh, the, uh, the needs of various communities within their jurisdiction uh, and uh, willing to, willingness to make room for other values uh, to exist within their uh, jurisdiction. And I think a further uh, obligation involves being open towards, especially with the courts, in terms of judicial interpretations uh, that potentially favor the enforcement of these uh, rights within domestic uh, uh, environments. And beyond that, I think that uh, we must realize that uh, uh, we have given situations in these uh, 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 societies, in these communities, and what we're dealing with is really a structural uh, problem. And therefore, that uh, as we uh, uh, you know, clarify the norms, we also have to be very clear in our goal that in order to ensure that these uh, uh, freedoms are observed in these countries, we really do need transformation of uh, these societies. Uh, because after decades of uh, uh, suppressing rights of people, usually the structures do not need any laws, really. Uh, what you need is now to reform and transform what has been created by those uh, laws. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that uh, uh, we face, that we have to accept that this is a, uh, uh, you know, an important objective, that we have to see it in that context. Uh, now, of course, as was mentioned, uh, you can either, you know, in terms of reform of a society, you can either go, you know, in a revolution way, or you can go into an incremental way. But I think that uh, clearly, you know, a revolutionary way is very destructive in that it, it tends to sweep away all uh, structures. And I think that it's possible to achieve these uh, objectives with working on an incremental uh, uh, basis. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. So I think that um, that's the, the point that I really wanted to emphasize, that uh, we have to look at uh, the question of having the norms clarified, as we do, what do we need to actually transform this society so that, in fact, they can make these rights real in the various communities that uh, we are dealing with. And I think there are you know, examples of uh, these kind of challenges uh, in other uh, spheres, and the, a jurisdiction that I'm uh, quite familiar with, you know, in terms of South Africa, for example, I mean, the challenge that by the time, you know, you're reaching 1994, apartheid actually did not need the laws that created it. Uh, and in order to dismantle what had been created, you need to transform the society. And this is what I think is a very big uh, challenge for us. So I think I'll end there and look forward to, you know, uh, discussions and comments. I have one observation and then one question for the panel. And the observation concerns all of our preoccupation with time. Uh, it's very striking that time is the one thing that most of the minorities that are represented here uh, in Turkey do not have. There's a particular urgency associated with the condition, which is in some cases nearing extinction for some of these minorities. So uh, given the urgency of time and the fact that uh, the endogenous factors inside Turkey, in particular the political class, does not seem inclined to follow the kind of advice and uh, candid discussion that the intellectual and civil society advocates here have shared with us today. Um, what, what would all of you as the operational panel begin to suggest in terms of uh, reaching out outside of Turkey for forms of leverage that can encourage uh, change within. Um, and I'm thinking of uh, an article that Orhan Kemal Cengiz wrote, I think it was three years ago now, called Waiting for Godot. And uh, in that article in Zaman, he encouraged our lunch speaker, he encouraged uh, the ecumenical patriarchate and, uh, to reach out to the European Court, to utilize the European Court of Human Rights uh, in order to try to bring remedies to these situations. Rather than presenting things in a zero sum way, I do ask you, however, to consider whether or not it's possible to find a judicious mix of resort to external institutions that can then dialogue or um, engage with Turkey to bring about uh, the kinds of in uh, internal change that we discuss repeatedly but um, are not really seeing occur. Do you have any specific suggestions? 
Well, it's always going to be a challenge to engage whether the U.S. or the European <coughs> governments on this issue because they have so many issues with Turkey. The U.S. very heavily on security issues, European Union on a number of others. So there's, I think it'd be useful as part of a dialogue. I don't think you're going to see extraordinary pressure come from official entities. It might be useful if uh, churches uh, that are interested in this issue could try to encourage their members who may be business people, who may be potential tourists, anyone with any kind of contacts with Turkey to bring this up on a consistent basis. So influential <coughs> Turkish citizens, whether in business or in other, you know, culturally, sports, and others would hear this as a matter of concern. So it is not seen as just something of Turkish minorities, but rather seen as something that engages people well beyond Turkey and well beyond the political process. And I think to emphasize the positive, which is if Turkey wants to play a lead role, if Turkey wants to be a significant power in the region, if Turkey wants an international leadership role, if Turkey wants greater business across the world and to be a bridge between East and West, these issues matter. And that Turkey wants leadership, this is an area to exercise leadership. And it's not reciprocity. It's not a question of what Greece is doing in Western Thrace or something. This is an issue of what Turkey is, the values that Turkey embodies, how it treats the people within its society that are, who mo are most vulnerable. And the, law, the larger the community that voices that and the louder the voice, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. And just to um, emphasize a point that you made, Turkey is the 16th largest economy in the world, 16th or 17th, depending on who's counting. But um, it's a, an enormous economy. Um, the country is enormous in terms of its geography. Its geopolitical importance is indisputable. And I think the political class in Turkey is well aware of that. So your, your uh, you know, counsel that this should be dialogical rather than pressure, I think, is one that would potentially resonate, but more solutions? Uh, it, it's so daunting that it's hard to speak of something that rises to the level of a solution. Uh, but uh, one of the things I've been intrigued by lately, I don't know how to effectively make this work, is this picking up on the notion of paying attention to the business sector. That is, there's a tendency to uh, focus on uh, human rights, on political institutions, on various kinds of dialogue, but in some ways uh, the, the business sector may be one of the largest areas of interaction. And I've been conscious over the last couple of years of uh, the UN Global Compact, uh, the number of major corporations that have signed on to be, uh, to be committed to human rights instruments. Uh, I admit being somewhat skeptical of this. It looks like a lot of PR to me. Uh, but human rights, in many ways, has been fundamentally PR. Human rights instruments do not work because there's some great court in the sky that you can go to, you can go to, but still you have to get things enforced. But public opinion makes a difference. And if, uh, we can work through the, the corporate sector as well as other sectors to, to apply pressure and to say, look, this is really going to make things better for your country, make things better for our employees, make things better for the general situation, and to have the number of voices multiplied and coming from some other areas than the traditional channels may be helpful. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I would think that um, uh, it's only really a question of uh, just international support. Or, I think we have to have a combination of a number of uh, players. The international community has a role to play, uh, but we also have to strengthen, uh, you know, the civil society within uh, Turkey. Uh, they have to, a major role to play. Uh, the business sector, which has been uh, mentioned, I think whenever you're trying to promote change, you have to realize that there are people who have uh, interest in the status quo. Uh, and they're not going to just give up that way. So that's why you need to mobilize and see how you can actually transform the situation. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the challenges. And, and, and one looks at uh, the fact that Turkey right now is considering you know, a new constitution. Now, I mean, there is an opportunity, and yet they're also really dangerous, uh, that unless the process is right, 
I mean, you're not going to get a constitution that is responsive to the needs of people. Uh, because the elites are not going on their own to develop a constitution that actually reduces their power. It has to be something that uh, uh, you, you, uh, uh, many uh, sectors are engaged in order to produce. And they have to be ownership of the process by the ordinary people, I think. Um, three years before, the Prime Minister Erdogan visited Athens. And uh, the day of the visit, uh, John Sofuglu, a friend of mine, a colleague uh, in Turkey, and myself wrote an article in a Greek newspaper, Kathimerini, and we asked from both the two prime ministers to ratify the Convention for the Protection of National Minorities of Council of Europe. This is a convention ratified by 39 European states, all members of Council of Europe, with a very important uh, uh, organ of control and a, a, a rich uh, and very important and interesting uh, case law for the protection of minorities. Uh, I repeat this, uh, let's say, hope, uh, in this Christian language is a hope that uh, at least uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, the Turkish authorities, will ratify this convention. We have to change the, let's say, the, the context of Lausanne Treaty, because it's not easy now to change the practice of interpretation of this convention, the realities of this convention. We have to, to, to adopt a modern uh, system a more legal context for the protection of minorities in Turkey. Any Greece, but let's say in Turkey, because this is the sub subject of our, the topic of our uh, meeting, of our conference. And this is an, a very interesting, a very excellent, my view, uh, context. The context of the Convention for the Protection of Ma National Minorities uh, of Strasbourg. I think we have um, six luxurious minutes in which we can uh, open to the audience for you to uh, make requests. This is such a, you know, a rich topic, so uh, uh, I would urge you to um, ask uh, any question you wish, but be as brief as possible so our panelists can try to respond. You've got one, Doug. Blinded by the light, as it were. Okay. I'd like to follow up a little bit more on Elizabeth's uh, question to the panel. And it just seems like today I learned a lot of things here today. I learned, for example, all these other minorities that have similar issues like the patriarch. <laughs> and, I, and I find out there's all sorts of these movements that are happening in Turkey. We need to do more to help these movements within from without. This is not Syria. This is not Iran. This is not some rogue country. This is a country that's tied to the West. It's part of NATO. It's part of the European, it wants to join the European Union. You said, I believe, Mr. Bandau, that for security reasons and other reasons, the United States most likely will not put pressure on Turkey any more than the European Union will. But I really feel that it's incumbent on us to go back to our governments, wherever we are, in the Western world, and petition them to put more pressure on them. And there should be more things that we can do. They're not part of the European Union, but they are part of the, um, uh, the, the customs union. Well, maybe they should be suspended from that. They are part of NATO. Nick, what's the question? Sorry, the question is, I'd like to hear more about what you think. Is there just lip service going on right now from, from the West, or can it be more tangible pressure put on Turkey? Will they, put, will, will they listen to this pressure? Will it make a difference, this pressure from the West, or will we just ignore it, unless there's some conditions put on it? My, my personal reaction is they're more likely to respond if it kind of comes as dialogue as opposed to imposition. You know, the imposition always gets people's backs up. I think you're right, and I think the U.S. policy for a long time has been skewed, and I think very badly for concerns on security that I don't think really play out in practice for a lot of reasons. But there's a lot there that I don't want to go there. 
But I do think there's a real opportunity now, given what's happening in the region and what's been happening in Turkey, its deteriorating relationship with Israel. There are a lot of issues that I think make it more vulnerable in terms of a state-to-state -state relationship with the United States, and I'm, I can't talk about Europe. And I do think there's an opportunity. I would agree that those who are concerned about these issues should go to the U.S. government and press for the U.S. to bring this up, make it an issue of discussion, make it clear that it matters to Americans as well as the U.S. government. I just indicate I think it's a challenge for a lot of reasons, but it is worth doing. The more voices, the more forums, the more sources of concern, the greater the likelihood that we will get some positive action within Turkey. I, I would just, the, the one thing I'm conscious of is that there's a tremendous risk here of getting an allergic reaction. Uh, and so, how well I agree entirely with, the, we need to find creative ways. I think we need to find ways, uh, and, and I don't have any instant answers, but ways that will uh, sort of invite Turkey to assert leadership. To, I mean, to do this in a way that is, that is uh, coming at them, affirming friendship and not merely uh, critique. Uh, otherwise, uh, they're drifting away from Europe. They're drift I, I think there's a lot of momentum that's going in the wrong direction, and the wrong kind of voices can make things even worse. Another question oh, in, in the back to the left. Forgive me for pointing. Thank you. Father Dimitri Tsigas from Melbourne, Florida. How can we sensitize the 99% of people in Turkey uh, to have compassion and understanding and uh, press for the need uh, to seek justice for their 1% of their neighbors? It's not easy. Uh, I think we all live in societies where sometimes it's hard to get fellow citizens to be sensitive on these issues. I think to the extent, again, it comes within rather than without, it has the best chance of acceptance, and it may be to the extent that we are able to help empower religious minorities within Turkey to make the case better themselves. So it does not appear to be the foreigners making the argument, but people who are fellish, fellow Turkish citizens bearing the burden that other Turks do, making the case. I wish I had a better answer. One other question here, I think, will be our last. Nick Chimicles uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Let me give you a hypothetical and ask that you take the hypothetical and do something with it. Let's assume for a moment that a month ago, Turkey announced that it was going to issue, for the first time in 10 years, euro bonds that were going to be underwritten by Barclays Bank, Deutsche Bank, and UBS. Now, each of those are international banks. Each of those operates under a code of ethics, which can be found on their websites. And part of the code of ethics of each of those banking institutions is a provision that we will not deal with sovereign entities that commit human rights violations. I put to the panel the question, what do you do with that fact? Well, well let, me, let me respond. Oh, by the way, the hypothetical is not a hypothetical. <laughs> it's reality. And, and this is a multi-billion dollar bond issue that Turkey, for the first time in 10 years, is going to be issuing underwritten by these banks. Well, this, this goes to my point about the global compact. It's a similar kind of notion. Uh, and actually, I can't remember if this happened when you were on the commission or not, but I, I know there was, uh, there was some talk among the commissioners of trying to go into the go into the money markets and put some pressure there. Uh, I'm not sure if that no, ever that was, happened. That was that, before my time. That was before your time. Okay. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think that there, there may be some very real leverage points if people take some things like commitments that a lot of, there's something like 7,000 major multilaterals, that, uh, multinationals, who have signed on to the UN Global Compact and have 
signed on, among other things, commitment number one is that they will support international human rights standards. Uh, if that were given some teeth in this kind of context, it would certainly get some attention. Uh, Just to add that uh, I think that uh, you, know, you have the uh, processes like the global compact and all that, but uh, I think we also have to emphasize that uh, you have to have uh, a way of monitoring uh, these mechanisms to make sure that, in fact, they are being uh, enforced. And that's where I think uh, uh, civil society has been playing a very big uh, role. I mean, there are many examples of, you know, for example, the, the blood diamond process, you know, the Kimberley process and all that, which really uh, a lot has been achieved through uh, this question, you know, way of uh, trying to monitor what's happening. Because you have the, the compact, you have all these uh, me mechanisms, but sometimes firms go and do that because no one is watching or no one is monitoring what's happening. And we have to bring it out so that it costs them money to do that. And I think that way you discourage that kind of behavior. Major multinationals are very sensitive on yeah. these issues. So certainly letters coming in from established organizations, churches, leading citizens, and publicity about this raising questions whether they are following their own code of ethics could be very useful. Listening to Mr. Chimicles, he may know the answer to this, um, but just listening to him being a lawyer and a litigator, um, the first thing I think I would do is I'd try to find out, are these code of ethics enforceable? And if they are, I'd bring lawsuit uh, trying to enforce them and try to stop the bond issue for having the bank in question uh, uh, you know, stop their participation in the bond issue. That's what I'd do. I don't know if they are enforceable. He may know the answer. Um, but, you know, maybe there's no, there's no answer to that question. Maybe it's worth bringing them to court to see if code of ethics are enforceable um, by a shareholder, for example, and bring some sort of shareholder derivatives. So that may be the way to go. And that way you're really going to scare these corporations. They know they're dealing with Turkey, um, that they're going to pay the consequences. Maybe you can get an injunction against them. Uh, who knows what? He, he may know the answer. I, I, think, I think we're near conclusion, but I would like to point out that the question about how do you get you know, all citizens of Turkey to become stakeholders in the kind of human rights change that's in every, every citizen's interest? Uh, most of the speakers this morning uh, are public intellectuals and activists. All of you write, I think, quite bravely and courageously in the Turkish press. And I think many of the speakers tomorrow as well. So I hope that we'll hear from you in terms of the way in which the you know, proverbial fourth estate uh, is being used or not used. The media is, is a, a mechanism for educating Turkish citizens more broadly about the plight of minorities, but also creating broad-based stakeholders that can perhaps bring about the attitudinal changes that uh, Dr. Indulo uh, uh, pointed out are requisite. So I think um, trying to be faithful to the time, I, I want to thank all of our panelists and certainly the audience. Uh, Your Eminence, Dr. Limbarakis and, uh, and Dr. Ro uh, George Rokas, um, and I think we're at our conclusion. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I don't mean, I just want to make an announcement that everyone should head down. For the announcement, we have to upload. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs>